watch this. <clears throat> okay, everybody, we're live. Welcome to the Neuro Reserve Brain Health hey. Panel. Yeah, we have a, this. I'm Ahmed, and I'm the founder of Neuro Reserve, and we have a wonderful panel today. Uh, experts in Alzheimer's and in advocacy, and we're going to be um, bringing them on uh, in just a moment. We're going to get started here, but it's going to be a great panel. So let's see, and we're going to bring on. We have to wait for them to request us. Mm -hmm. And while we're doing that, mm -hmm. I will just share a little bit about myself. I am Elizabeth Humphreys, and I'm executive director of Mind What Matters nonprofit. We are based out of Nashville and we focus solely on the caregivers of loved ones with Alzheimer's and other related dementias. All right. We have Dr. Annie Fenn joining us. She's the founder of the Brain Health Kitchen. We have actress, advocate, advocate, advocate. Oh my gosh. You can tell <laughs> I've been doing this already for an so hour. Right now I'm inviting everybody in. So there actress, you go. advocate for Alzheimer's, actress Nikki Deloach, and Dr. Tom Holland. So we have a big panel. We have lots of people that are going to be talking about a lot of different topics today, um, brain health, prevention of Alzheimer's disease, how you can recognize the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, what you can do if you are living with a loved one who you suspect might have some dementia um, symptoms. And we're also just going to kind of dive in a little bit to the science behind Alzheimer's. <laughs> All Hi, right. Tom. Hey. Hey. How's it going? It is up. There you go. We're Good. trying to log. This is about as many people as we've ever had on an Instagram live. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see how much we can cram into this thing. Ed and I's heads so. are just like glued Great. together over here. All right. So we're just going to stand by for a second and see if people will come in. But we have, uh, so Tom Holland here, and there's Nikki. I can't believe we're all on here. We're all on, except for Annie. We're still, we're still working on Annie. Okay. Annie, there we go. I'm, Annie, I'm finishing Annie. off my brain healthy breakfast. Well, now you need to wait to brag because she is not on. She can't hear you. There she is. Hi, everybody. Right. Hi. Hey. You guys, I feel like the Brady Bunch. I'm gonna wave down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so this is a great opportunity for some ex we got experts all around here. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, brain health, prevention, genetics. Uh, we'll touch upon all these things because I know we know that these are really big topics, but it's a good time. Last month was Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Coming up is the Alzheimer's Association International Conference at the end of this month. So there's, this is a really great time of year to talk about and, and get people to understand Alzheimer's disease and related dementias a little bit better. Uh, now, I'm going to ask people to introduce themselves as they come on, because I don't think I'm going to do it justice to the people on here. Uh, but what I want to do is uh, just start out with Nikki. Actually, so Nikki Deloach, um, she is an advocate uh, and also happens to be an actress and a producer. Uh, but, an but, but I said the word so right. ac a advocate, activist, <laughs> and Alzheimer's. And one thing that we were talking about was just making people understand Alzheimer's better because it helps everyone address it better, people who don't have it, and it humanizes it more. So, Nikki, can you tell us a little bit more about just your background, how you became an advocate, and what's important for advocacy uh, around uh, brain health and Alzheimer's? Thanks, And Ed. please introduce yourself. So. Oh, first of all, I'd like, this is so cool to be able to do this. Um, hi, Annie and Tom. We haven't yet to meet, so it's so cool to be able to do this with you. Thank you guys so much. Um, Liz and I share very similar stories because we are, um, we're people who got into the work because we were caring for a loved one. Um, Alzheimer's hit my family first with my grandfather, with my papa, who I was just super, super close to. He had vascular dementia via strokes that he had. So he presented in a very different way than my dad when my dad, dad was diagnosed with Pick's disease at 62. Um, and we think the Pick's disease actually started in his 50s when we tracked back his behaviors and when everything began to shift for him. And so Obviously, it presented very differently with my dad because it was frontal temporal. So 
you know, we dealt with Alzheimer's with one way with my grandfather and then completely different with my dad. I mean, vastly different. And so when my grandfather, when it started happening, I really started doing research. And then when my dad was diagnosed, I became a full blown advocate and activist for Alzheimer's and dementia and brain health, to, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think for me and Liz, it's like we're trying to understand it as caregivers and as people who, for me, um, lost loved ones to this disease, we're trying to um, spread the word and, and talk about it as much as possible. Talk about what we've, you know, we've come to know and love. I got involved with Mind What Matters because what I did learn in the disease is how much the caregivers suffer. I was talking earlier on our pre-live, um, Dr. Jason, Jason Carlowish says that, you know, it's not just one person who's diagnosed. There's actually two patients when a diagnosis happens. And so uh, Mind What Matters, we are able to raise money to give caregivers grants. And that's how Elizabeth and I came together. And that's actually how I met this whole entire team. <laughs> so long story, very short. It was personal to me. It's still personal to me. It'll be personal to me until I take my last breath in this world. And um, I am just feeling super, super grateful to be connected to all of you guys so we could do it together. Nobody has to do this alone. And yeah, I act and do stuff like that, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much, Nikki. And and uh, so we'll just dive right into some of these, uh, some of the questions that we got. We got a lot, and we got a lot of questions. We categorize them as best we could, and we'll touch upon them. But the first area is, is actually prevention. So people are very interested in prevention. Um, how does Alzheimer's happen? What are the risk factors? What can predict it? Uh, and and what can we do to to stave that off? And uh, and you know, Tom, I'll have, I'll have you start out on this. And, uh, and just as a brief introduction, Tom's at Rush University Medical Center, uh, came out of the research group that invented the MIND diet, uh, and so still doing research in that. But Tom, why don't you just take it away? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, from a prevention perspective, you know, there's a lot going on with uh, just where we are with prevention in general. And this is across the world. Uh, I think one, one thing that I read the other day was that uh, any one time in the world, your thought is shared by another two people, roughly. So with that, from a scientific perspective, there's a lot of work being done. So we just finished the Mind Diet trial, which was uh, started and funded through the National Institute on Aging, um, looking at a dietary intervention for cognition in hopes of either uh, prevention or slowing uh, the rate of cognitive decline. This was the first ever dietary intervention for cognition. Um, and so that was started by Martha Claire Morris, who uh, with Dr. Christy Tegney invented the MIND diet. Um, and unfortunately, Martha Claire passed away about two years ago, but her work was continued on by Dr. Lisa Barnes, as well as Dr. Julie Schneider. Um, but from a prevention perspective, a lot of work is being done again in this uh, diet perspective or diet realm. So mind diet, uh, 15 components, 10 good, five bad, uh, Mediterranean diet, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of as well as DASH, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So that's on a diet side. And then from other modality perspective, physical activity, um, but not just general physical activity, you really need to focus on the quantity and quality. So uh, aerobic is uh, presumptively the best. As one uh, scientist has told me, every other kind of physical activity should support you doing aerobic. So strength training, balance, exercise, or sorry, stretching, but really focusing on your moderate to vigorous levels of physical activity is very important. Really get that heart pumping, get uh, 70 to 80% of your max heart rate. Uh, and then from there, cognitive activities and cognitive training um, we use uh, Posit Science, uh, the Brain HQ program, uh, for our one of our trials, um, the Pointer trial that's also sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and then beyond that, uh, getting good sleep, uh, you know, stress reduction, um, this aspect of socialization and having meaningful relationships really helps forge strong neural networks. 
Uh, and then, you know, just other aspects, um, making sure that you have good eyesight, good hearing, going to see your PCP and having your cholesterol. Yeah, good oral health, um, big, solid hearing, um, seeing your PCP, having your cholesterol levels checked, making sure that your uh, A1C and glucose levels are under control are all mm -hmm. very important factors that as a composite really make up this full picture of a prevention kind of algorithm, if you will. That's a lot of stuff right there, Tom. It is a lot of stuff. That's a lot, <laughs> yeah. So, so how, you, you know, when, when you talk about uh, sleep for one, like wh why is sleep so important? Because that's one thing that I really struggle with. Because it is, Ed. Because it is. <laughs> because it is. Uh, it gives your body time to uh, <laughs> more or less rest and relax. And we think of sleep as also helping with this anti-inflammation and giving your body time to, again, reset. Um, there's also, you know, just this uh, aspect that appropriate sleep as well is important. So we talk about physical activity being quantity and quality. Sleep as well is quantity and quality. If you're having disrupted sleep from either sleep apnea or... Uh, you don't have good sleep hygiene that can also impact how our brains are functioning just day to day, but also in a longitudinal perspective. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. So Annie, I know you have tons of things um, to, to discuss regarding diet. And now we got Tom here, who's, you know, right there in the middle of it, in the middle of all the mind diet research going on. So I'm sure you and Tom can go off for you know, an hour on this. Uh, but, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on prevention regarding diet and, and other areas that, that, that you recommend? But you know, we, I know your passion is diet. But first, introduce <laughs> yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I got kicked out of the room, but I'm back, obviously. Um, I'm Annie Fenn. I'm a physician. Um, I've been to culinary school. I started the Brain Health Kitchen, which is a, a school that is focused primarily on preventing Alzheimer's through neuroprotective foods. And Tom, we have not met in person, but I'm probably your biggest fan in the entire world. <laughs> when the Mind Diet study came out in 2015, it's one of the things that sort of launched me or basically kicked me in the butt towards a path where I was focusing primarily on Alzheimer's prevention because um, the first Mind Diet study, the one that came out in 2015 that you worked on with Do Dr. Martha Claire Morris, um, it was just, it just really blew up the whole prevention world in Alzheimer's, showing that just by changing what you eat, doing 10, you know, including 10 brain healthy food groups and staying away from the five brain unhealthy ones was able to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 53%. Um, I thought that was mind blowing. And I decided to start Brain Health Kitchen basically to share that information. And of course, then we, we, you know, our, our, our knowledge base is building, but it's all, you know, the, the foundation of what we know about nutrition and preventing Alzheimer's is the Mediterranean diet studies, the mind diet study, the mind diet trial that hopefully will be coming out soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, what was your question? My three favorite brain foods? Was that your question? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, you know, what, what advice would you give on, on, the, on the daily aspects of just, just maintaining the right nutrition and the right diet? Uh, just from a practical culinary perspective as well, you know. Like Andy, yeah, so seven you know, pillars. Oh, seven pillars. I would say your seven pillars. <laughs> so this is going to be new. I, thought there I have six. a lot of pillars. Okay, I would say you know people try to make it so complicated. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm at risk for Alzheimer's. My mom has it, or you know, I, I have this you know this history where I've never slept for twenty years. Everyone has some sort of a risk factor when it comes right down to it. But I think what you do with your diet is start with the foods that you like to eat that you also learn are neuroprotective. Don't start from scratch, like saying, I'm going to be whole food plant-based 100%. I will never touch a cube of cheese again. I think that's just setting yourself up for failure. So start where you are. I would say think about your own brain food pyramid and what are the foods that you like to eat. So let's say I had to pick three food groups. Um, which of course is impossible. But um, if I go by the science, I would pick berries, I would pick fish and seafood, and I would pick leafy greens and vegetables. And I'm lumping them together. I'm cheating, obviously, because those are two different food groups. 
but um, I couldn't choose between one or the other. So I would say, you know, what do I like in the fish and seafood world? What do I like in the leafy green world? Maybe I love romaine lettuce, but I don't like arugula. It's too peppery for me. So I would start thinking about the foods that you really like and then just really try to get those foods into your diet on a daily, weekly basis based on the Mind Diet guidelines or a great way to start. Mm -hmm. and, and, what, and, and what is, so what are the main components of the Mind Diet? Just, you know, I know Tom, Tom could probably pipe in. I, I'm not sure if he's like, you know, lagging a little bit, but. Um, well, like, like Tom said, the Mind Diet researchers very elegantly broke it down into 10 brain healthy food groups and five food groups to stay away from. And it's all based on the science behind each food group. So berries is its own food group in the Mind Diet. Not that other fruits aren't good for you, it's just that berries are you know, super high in anthocyanins and they also have tons of data to show that a certain dose, like two half cups in a week, can actually protect your memory. So we have the data to prove that berries deserves to be its own category, right? We have other studies to show that citrus fruits are good too, but if we had to pick one fruit, it would be berries. Um, leafy greens, what the Mind Diet did is it took leafy greens out from the whole, um, the whole group of vegetables because leafy greens had certain studies behind them to show that they're particularly neuroprotective. So if you don't, if you don't like vegetables at all, I would say if you had to just pick one vegetable in the whole vegetable kingdom, I would pick leafy greens, okay? Vegetables is the third um, food group, and that means getting cruciferous vegetables. I would include mushrooms in here, even though they're obviously fungi, they're not really vegetables, but I would make them honorary vegetables because now we have data out of Asia and Italy showing that they also can be part of your neuroprotective diet. So we've got berries, leafy greens, we've got vegetables, Nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds are extremely common um, components of meals in the Mediterranean countries um, and a lot of the, the countries in the blue zones where they ha enjoy dementia-free longevity. So I add seeds as a little bonus food group, although in the Mind Diet, it was, just, it was just nuts. Fish and seafood, like we talked about, because we need to get certain types of fatty acids and we only get them really through fish and seafood. That's the DHA and the EPA that um, Ed and Tom, you guys are all experts on. Um, so include this food group if you eat animal products, okay? And then there's legumes. Legumes are extremely important. Every single blue zone in the world includes legumes, some sort of beans, some sort of split pea. Um, I think the serving guidelines are three half cups cooked per week. So it's not like you have to eat a ton of beans, but you have to eat some beans because they have so many different uh, benefits. Um, and then we have uh, grains, whole grains. People get really confused about whole grains because the Mind Diet says to have three half cup servings per day. And that seems like so much, like three servings of grains a day. You know, aren't grains bad for your brain? Well, refined grains, like in all purpose flour and cookies and cakes and pastries and biscuits and lots of the sweets that you purchase, those are actually not good for your brain at all. Probably detrimental akin to sugar. Um, but whole grains are incredibly good for your brain. And three half cup servings is really not that much. It's like, a, it's like a small bowl of oatmeal, a piece of whole grain toast, and maybe a scoop of quinoa with your dinner. Okay. Okay. Hey, um, Tom, Tom did, is, is Annie nailing it here? Yeah. Yeah. She's getting right <laughs> after it. Sounds great. I think I'm going to pass out if somebody does Okay. How many, how many do I have left? I know that olive, olive oil. oil. Olive oil. Olive oil. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Olive oil isn't yeah. here right now. I had to put it outside. I have a dog named Olive Oil. But um, olive <laughs> oil, the, the Mediterranean diet and the Mayan diet actually want you to use olive oil as your primary cooking oil. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to drink gobs of it. You don't have to drink a cup of it. You have to do shots of it. But if you're using olive oil as your primary oil, you're getting benefits from the fatty acid components of it, which is mostly monounsaturated. And it also contains polyphenols. And a lot of, most cooking oils do not have polyphenols in it. Yeah. And, it's, and, it's and very the one low thing I do want to point out, out um, when you do start making dietary modifications or any modification of any kind, uh, just like you would go to the gym and uh, you could be working out and your muscles get sore because you haven't worked that muscle out in a while, you change your diet. You have to give your body time to catch up. Mm -hmm. So uh, your microbiome, so your gut bacteria takes, can start modify, modifying in about 24 hours, but can take about a month to be completely modified. 
So if, uh, as you were saying, if you're taking shots of olive oil, it, it can run off quite quickly. Uh, if you're <laughs> in taking leafy greens, uh, it can uh, cause some gas and bloating. And so and the reason I bring this up is because when you're making these modifications, you don't want to be turned off from modifications because your uh, GI system is upset. It says that your body is making changes. And the way I like to explain it is, if you're used to intaking burgers and intake leafy greens, your body's going to say, hey, I know how to process red meat and grease. Right. I don't know how to process leafy greens. So let's get that out of here. But after a while, you intake your leafy greens, you're good to go. And then all of a sudden you have a greasy burger that's like a 70-30. Mm -hmm. It might taste real good. But then your body's going to say, hey, we don't really remember how to process this grease we anymore. And you're going to have an upset stomach. <laughs> So it happens on both sides, but you have to be very mm -hmm. cognizant to give your body time to modify and be ready to intake and break those foods down. I, can I add, can I have a, a I have a little hanger on her um, for our doctors in the room. Um, can you guys touch upon the gut brain health? Like essentially we're saying these foods are good for you, right? But can you touch upon why like, for example, when my dad was diagnosed, everything shifted with the way that I do everything. I mean, everything. I used to not sleep. Now I sleep as I will fight somebody for my sleep. Like, you ask my husband, I will literally, like, I will fight him for sleep. Um, but, like, specifically with gut health, like, that became so, so, so important to me because of the connection between the gut and the brain. Can you guys just talk on that for a minute so people understand that connection? a good question absolutely i'm actually i'm um, uh, sure i'll take a stab on, at uh, that if, oh, yeah, you, go, go, go. if you follow the mind diet guidelines um you are basically following a, a predominantly plant-based diet and like we said build your own pyramid lead up to it don't start off by eating you know like all these portions of beans or vegetables that you're not used to um, and as you do that, your gut microbiota, the colonies of the different microbiota in your GI tract will change. So, you know, the old thinking used to be, oh, I can't eat beans because my, my stomach gets upset and I can't eat that food group. The current thinking is you can't eat beans because you, don't ha you haven't developed enough colonies of microbiota that know how to digest it. Mm -hmm. And like Tom said, it takes about a month. And you'll notice this if you're starting to eat healthy, if you're going from like a Western diet to a more, you know, brain healthy diet, you will notice that you will have some upset along the way. It's giving your gut time to diversify the numbers and types of different colonies there that can digest this food. And just like Tom said, um, I think I had something the other day that I don't eat very often. It was a pork sandwich Potato or something. Chips. I don't eat much meat anymore, hardly at all. Mm. And I ate this sandwich and I was ill and I used to eat pork all the time. Um, so I now, now I'm thinking, you know, I don't have gut microbiota to, to deal with this anymore, nor can I deal with a diet that's very high in saturated fat because the mind diet is basically, it's quite low in saturated fat, um, even lower than the, the Mediterranean diet, which is probably, I don't correct me if I'm wrong, the secret behind its success. Yeah. So, so Tom, what, yeah, what, what is the good bacteria? What's the bad bacteria? Like, how does this all, because Annie's, Annie's, you know, describing how the food affects it and, and, and what, what, what is that? Well, instead of thinking of it as good and bad bacteria, it's more diversified types of bacteria. And when we think about the gut brain axis in particular, we think of the stomach as this reservoir where we're starting to break down foods and then we get to the small intestine, which is uh, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And that's where we start absorbing these nutrients in particular, uh, where, you know, we've got uh, our iron, our uh, aspects of uh, just A, D, E, and K, our fat-soluble vitamins, all of our B vitamins, all of the minerals, etc., are all absorbed in this uh, small intestine. And so as we're going through, that gets absorbed. But if you don't have the diversity uh, of bacteria in that, uh, the gut, you're not going to be able to break those foods down to actually absorb the nutrients. Because if you think about it from a intake perspective, everything from chewing 
and movement in your stomach, movement through your bowel, is to break it down from this large molecule to a singular molecule to then be absorbed into the body and then built back up and then transported to the tissue that needs it. So again, it's going to be more a diverse aspect of bacteria as we're moving through our gut. Did we answer your question, Nikki? Yes, you did. I just, sometimes we, we throw out suggestions, right, of things. And I think it's important to understand the whys, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I think it, it helps us to hang on to the information and to understand, like Annie, you were saying, like, I might not have the, the gut health or the gut binome to be able to process this certain food. So I'm going to have to just hang on to it and keep building that up for a little bit before it can get processed. And, and I think that helps people to understand. Also, this is just me being nosy. Um, Dr. Holland, you were saying that you're doing a class or you're doing a something, oh. right? After this, I'm teaching GI physiology. My gosh, I wish I could be in your class. <laughs> it's an online professor. <laughs> it is honest? online for some of our students. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really like to get into a lot of detail uh, when it comes to this. Because to your point, uh, being able to understand the mechanisms behind why these foods and nutrients are really improving your health or improving the aspect of uh, prevention really helps people grasp why. Yeah. And I mean, that's one thing that, you know, fortunately I have the time to spend with participants in studies, but I get to that nitty gritty of just translating our, our medical talk to them so that they can understand this and then carry that with them moving forward. And uh, it really does help if you understand why behind what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Agreed. As uh, doing all the advocacy work I've done in the last five years, I can say the why is really important. Mm -hmm. So it does answer my question. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so I think how about we shift gears a little bit? We have a couple things. One thing and one thing we want to touch upon was caregiving. So and there was a there's a couple questions there. Uh, and then also we want to get to genetics. So um, because I know, Nikki, you had brought up and other people have brought up to you about APOE4, right? Yes. So, um, yes. Do you want, should we hit, um, we could hit just, there are some questions about personality changes from the caregiving standpoint, people being very happy um, and then becoming very angry and, and, and very unmanageable. And how do we, how do we deal with that both with them and also the grief that we have in our own selves that, that happens. And, you know, Liz, you know, and, 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 and Nikki, if you can kind of walk through that and, and, and anyone else here, obviously, you know, here. Um, Liz, why don't you start, let's break it up. Why don't you start with, do you want to start with like personality changes and stuff like that? And then I can like pivot into the grief portion. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is actually the personality changes that can happen in somebody that is suffering from any kind of dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, this can often really happen well before, in some cases, years before somebody has an actual diagnosis. And um, as I've said many, many times, this can often create a lot of tension in families because essentially what you have is a family member who you've always loved and known to be one way, um, oftentimes behaving in a radically different, in, in a different way. And no one really understands if there's not a diagnosis or if there's not you know, a medical practitioner telling you what's wrong, you know, everyone just responds with confusion. Um, some people get angry, other people get sad, some people just get confused, you know, how do I handle this person? And so maybe they just draw away completely. Um, and, and oftentimes this creates a lot of division and divisiveness in families because let's say you have one sibling that really dives into this problem and says, no, you know, this isn't, this isn't right for mom or dad, or, you know, you have a group of kids who are like, mom, dad, you know, this isn't right. What's happening with mom or dad? But then the other, their spouse gets very protective and says, no, 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 there's nothing wrong. You know, maybe they're in some sort of denial or they're just not really wanting to confront the problem. It can create a whole host of issues. And at the end of the day, the personality changes that happen in, in somebody with this disease are because of the disease. And so that is why getting a diagnosis and having your loved ones see a practitioner early and getting to the root cause of what's going on can prevent so many 
of this kind of familial turmoil. Um, but oftentimes it's really challenging to do. You know, it's really hard to, number one, sometimes convince the patient that there's anything wrong. And it can be very challenging to get them to a doctor. Um, and so for that reason, this can go on, you know, for years. But, but what I would say is it's so important to remember, you know, even after a diagnosis and even after you realize what's going on in the disease, it still is unbelievably challenging to watch somebody who you have known your whole life change in front of you. And, you know, it can be small things at first, such as, you know, their lack of interest in doing activities that they've always done. You know, maybe they've always been in a garden club or a book club, or they've always loved to knit or to paint or whatever. And then all of a sudden that just kind of stops suddenly. Or for my mom, it wasn't just that, it was also a complete lack of empathy. It almost vanished overnight. I mean, really and truly, I remember on like a seven day trip with her one time um, back when I was in my mid twenties of just, really getting upset about something. We had gone to visit my grandmother and I was concerned it was the last time I was going to see her and it was crying. And, you know, my mom just couldn't have been less affected. Just sort of looked at me like, I don't know what your problem is. You know, it was just a very bizarre experience. And it left me feeling so angry and just what is wrong with you? You know, how can you possibly act like this? You know, I'm your daughter and I'm upset. And I mean, gosh, you guys, that ca I carried those feelings with me for years, and it was largely due because we did not have a diagnosis, and then we had an improper diagnosis. It's a very complex question, and, you know, we could talk a long time about just this, and Ed and I were actually talking about maybe doing a series of these talks with you guys so we can really dive further into these types of questions and spend longer talking about them, but all I would say is, you know, you've got to have help. You've got to seek counseling. Um, somebody to help you walk this road because it is really traumatic at times and you are fairly unprepared when your loved one just starts acting in ways that, you know, are unfamiliar and are shocking. Um, it just brings about a whole nother level of complexity to the caregiving experience. So with that, I'll let Nikki take it away on the grief side. <laughs> grief is my middle name recently. Um, <laughs> Nikki Grief Deloach. So um, I will also add to, you know, you guys, there's a very nuanced reason why we are in the situation that we are in with getting a diagnosis for, diagno for dementia and Alzheimer's right now. And it goes back to the 80s and certain political things that happened back then that didn't allow for us to have a structure for dealing with Alzheimer's today and why kind of we're also in the crisis that we're in today. And if you guys want to learn about that, there's an incredible book called The Problem with Alzheimer's by Dr. Jason, Jason Carlowish. And it really dives into why it's so hard to get a diagnosis. We do not have the infrastructure because at the end of the day, Alzheimer's disease, it's not a good business model for America, right? And for a lot of diseases, if there's not a good business model, then it doesn't become something that we're going to pay attention to and support in the way that we need to. Um, we can change that. Obviously, we can change anything. But right now, this is the way it's set up. So without going into all of the nitty gritty of all of that, I'm just going to give you the suggestion to go read the book, The Problem with Alzheimer's by Dr. Jason Carlowish. It's brilliant. And it, there's so much other information that will help you understand. So if you're dealing with trying to get a diagnosis and you know something's wrong, do not be shocked. If you, most people on average spend one to two years trying to get a diagnosis. Okay. That's on average. So that could be four years. It could be six months, but just know that it could take a long time because most general practitioners are not educated the, the way that, you know, they need to be in order to, to be able to help people specifically in the world of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, so specifically with grief, what I will say is you begin to grieve the moment you get your diagnosis, sometimes even before that, unknowingly, because you're grieving the parts of your loved one that aren't there anymore. For example, the empathy and the compassion. I mean, my dad was the most kind, gentle, loving, I mean, just, like he was just so gentle and nurturing and all of a sudden he had zero interest in his grandchildren and me and I, like it was such a swing 
from who he normally is. And the tendency is to be like, what's wrong with you? I would say, assume the best of that person and assume that there actually may some be something medically wrong with them. But that's when you begin to grieve. And the only thing I can say about grief is that um, I'm also gonna give you a good book for that because um, Marissa Renee Lee wrote a book called Grief is Love. And it really helped me. My dad passed away. Um, we're coming up on the first anniversary. So if I get teary, um, I'm sorry. But he passed away um, almost a year ago, July 27th, um, from Pick's disease. And he was 66 years old. And he was my North Star. And um, what I understand about grief so far is that it's, it's, first of all, it's awful. Um, I became a different person on July 27th of 2021, and I'm still trying to figure out who she is. So you have to be so patient with yourself. You have to give yourself grace. Grace is such a huge part of it because you have to give it to yourself and you have to give it to other people who don't know where you're at they don't get it if they haven't been through it. They don't know. They expect you just to be, I mean, I remember with a very close beloved of mine about three months into it saying, well, I just wanna know like when this is kind of gonna be over, like when it, where you're gonna like kind of just go back to normal. And I, at the time I wanted to be like, I, I'm gonna put my hands around your throat and choke you. Like, you know, but what I came to understand is people feel sometimes really uncomfortable with grief. And if they've never been through it, they don't get it. They don't get what it does to you. So patience, grace, kindness to yourself and to others when they don't get it, obviously. But um, it's such a long process. And because grief is love, and I never understood this before Marissa's book, um, you love you don't start loving your loved one you will never i will never stop loving my dad ed i know that you can relate to this as well i will never stop loving him for the rest of my life so i will always be living with grief mm -hmm. i will never get over it i will just learn how to live with it and i will find ways sometimes beautiful ways to live with it but that's my experience so far with grief and um and like I said, please go get Marissa Renee Lee's book. It's called Grief is Love. And it helped me tremendously to understand what I'm feeling. Yeah. And I, I remember when my, my father was first um, showing signs of dementia, of course, I didn't recognize it. And, uh, and, and I, love, I love what you said earlier about thinking the best of people. Like, they really have the best intentions. It's just a disease that's starting to take hold. And I, I used to get very upset at my father because he would not have any interest in what I was doing. And I'd come home and I'd tell him about, you know, what I was doing and he would, he would just look off into the distance. And I thought he was just, uh, didn't care. he didn't care. Abandoning about, you. Yeah, abandoning me, yeah. And, yeah. but of course, years later, I finally re recognized that. And if we think the best of them, uh, we can really peer past all of that surface um, and, and see what's going on. And, um, so one, one area that, that we did want to get to is, is genetics. Uh, and, yes. and, uh, and, you know, people were asking about what is APOE4, and then on top of that, you know, APOE4 and, and, and women's risk um, and how they might combine. So just, you know, Tom, Tom can you describe to us what APOE4 is? And, and uh, that genetic factor. And then maybe Annie, you could talk a little bit mm -hmm. about like the female side of it too. Yeah, for sure. So um, first, I did want to to mention it from a diagnostic perspective. Um, Alzheimer's is essentially a kind of I would say double edged sword uh, in the sense of history. Um, we are living longer, but Alzheimer's. Uh, disease in dementia specifically is a disease of aging. So the older we are, the higher propensity there is to have this uh, cognitive decline. And so again, it's great that we are having individuals live longer, but it's also introducing the possibility for disease processes to occur in later life. And to the diagnostic uh, point, 
although it's not widely used because it's still being studied. Um, before, I think a lot of individuals know this, but Alzheimer's disease was a diagnosis uh, post-mortem, so after death. And now we've got the clinical diagnostic capability and call it Alzheimer's dementia. Now there are scans and tagging, and again, it hasn't been fully tested yet, so, it, so it's not available for uh, public use all the way, but MK6240 is tagged for uh, looking at neurofibrillary tangles, which is that hyperphosphorylated tau protein. Mm -hmm. And uh, floor beta ban is another tagging for neuritic plaques, um, looking at A beta 40 and 42. So onto the APOE, APOE is a lipoprotein. So it stands for apolipoprotein E4. And so what E4 indicates is a higher propensity to develop a Alzheimer's uh, dementia or disease, if you will, to have that uh, neuropathology. So there's E2, which is thought to be protective. E3 is just a normal, uh, normal variant. And then E4 is increasing that risk. And there's two different alleles. And so whenever we look at APOE4, we say, is there any APOE4? And then if you're homozygous, meaning you have both the alleles of E4, um, that leads to a higher likelihood of leading to this uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease or dementia. Now with that, we think about the uh, neuropathology and burden, and there's a uh, term called cognitive reserve. And what that means is somebody could have neuropathology and they could have the APOE, but never develop the clinical syndrome. And that's about one third of people. So it's, again, APOE4 does, isn't a, uh, a life sentence to having uh, this trajectory of developing dementia, um, but it does increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. Mm -hmm. And and how does it when when it comes to APOE four? So you're saying there's like there's there's you can have one hit of it, or, two. or yep. you can have two, two. hits, yeah. right? So you'd be heterozygous or homozygous, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you have one hit, you have some risk. Mm -hmm. And if you're homozygous, then you're going to have more risk. So and it's it's more a and again it's a risk kind of, uh, you could talk about maybe a risk algorithm, um, but then that's where lifestyle and prevention comes into play as well, is you could have this kind of cognitive uh, resiliency or reserve that prevents the onset of the disease process. Okay, and that's a really important point, right? Because yep. if, if it's not like an automatic death sentence, if you will, right. if you have one or two and your risk immediately just goes boom, boom, and it's going to stay there, you can actually start to kind of bend it down through lifestyle, dietary factors, things like that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So it's a matter of, uh, you know, with all of our participants, we do genetic testing. For the most part, people don't want to know what their uh, risk is is based on <laughs> genetic testing because it, there is a, a taboo of knowing this and then having this in the back of your head that there isn't a lot that can be done. And, uh, you know, although there aren't medications, uh, good medications for Alzheimer's right now, uh, there is a lot that can be done. And we think about mixed type pathologies as well, this kind of hybrid between Alzheimer's type dementia and vascular dementia. But if you can do a lot of lifestyle interventions to improve your vascular health, neurovascular or cardiovascular, then you're also improving the likelihood of prevention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also add that I think a lot of people don't really understand what it means to inherit a genetic mutation. So um, the APOE4 is a risk gene. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you're gonna get anything. It's right. not like when you inherit a single gene defect the gene for cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. You inherit that and you get the disease. It's very clear. <laughs> With APOE4, it's not so clear. You know, one copy, your risk may be increased. It might be double, it might be threefold increased in the course of your long life. Um, two copies, it may be as much as 12-fold increased. 
but it's so interesting because in different parts of the world, people express APOE4 differently. In Southern Italy, for example, having two copies of APOE4 does not increase your risk of Alzheimer's significantly because the environment there, maybe it's the Mediterranean diet, maybe it's the exercise, maybe it's because they have siestas, maybe it's because um, they have community, all of those things. Um, they don't have an increased risk of actually getting Alzheimer's in the face of the gene. That's the crazy. That's it's crazy. so cool. These genes are pliable. These genes, these genes can be turned off or on based on um, our, our environment, based on nutrition, based on exercise. But with women, it gets even more interesting. Um, women who are carriers of APOE4 tend to have an accelerated path to Alzheimer's compared to men. And so when you combine wow. being female, getting older, having APOE4 gene, you have a very heightened sense that you could be vulnerable to Alzheimer's. And all of these things that we talk about in terms of prevention, um, you know, you need to get on it and do it and make that your priority in life. Because um, women have about a five-year accelerated path to Alzheimer's if they carry one of these gene mutations. So that's really important to know as well. So I was hey, feeling Dr. like really good and I was about to go into really big complacency mode because I was thinking, ah, I'm breathing a sigh of relief, but no, we got to stay on top of it no matter what. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, yes. Yes. Hey, Fred, but, uh, do you mind, do you mind if we yeah. follow up with them since we're on this topic with uh, mm -hmm. Tom and Annie um, with the women and Alzheimer's? Cause she brought up the women and Alzheimer's like, um, can we discuss that like for a minute, meaning the recent study, that the recent research that came out of for Dr. Moscone? That's great. If, if you'd uh, like sure. to I mean, Dr. Moscone has come out with several key uh, landmark papers in the last five years, along with Dr. Roberta Brinton from the University of Arizona and some others. And one of the key findings is that at the time of menopause, in the perimenopause, which is the years before and after the last menstrual period, women's brains are actually changing at a structural level and becoming more vulnerable to Alzheimer's in this time period. And so it's really important to recognize when your estrogen levels are fluctuating that you could, it could be spurring you into um, increased symptomatology or starting on a path where your brain can take a hit from the menopause. But she's also discovered that if you take care of your brain during the perimenopause, much like we take care of it to prevent Alzheimer's, then the brain is resilient and you can come out of it without any damage whatsoever. But it may be important for women who are carriers of APOE4, one or two copies, that when they go through menopause, they may have a particularly difficult time. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, if you think about how much, I mean, I don't know, at least for me, I certainly have noticed as I've moved into my 40s, the propensity for women, at least that I've you know, that I'm around on a regular basis, you know, I think a lot of women combat these natural things in aging with, you know, lots of wine, lots of red wine, lots of white wine. It can be one of the worst things that you're actually doing for your brain and it's already vulnerable. Absolutely. To Absolutely. Uh, the absolute worst thing Annie, you can do to combat perimenopause symptoms is drink alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but everybody needs to feel better. Everybody needs some stress. You know, alcohol is a stress reducing beverage. But if you start to think of, other until things, the next morning beverages <laughs> effect um i like to think of the brain health mindset you know your brain is valuable you want to take care of your brain we have so many great studies and we have so much knowledge about how to do that right now and we're learning more and more every day but get into your brain health mindset what is it that you want to do to take care of your brain what is your particular risk and what are you worried about and what are you going to do about it Mm -hmm. And I think it all starts there. So when you're looking at a big glass of wine and you're not feeling great and you're having menopausal symptoms or you haven't slept, you look at that glass of wine and you think, is that really good for my brain or not? Yep. Is it going to impact your sleep? We know sleep is key. Mm -hmm. um, is it going to impact yes. your memory? Yes. Do you remember <laughs> things when you're drinking? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's so true. But, you know, Annie, no. I love your take on things in particular, 
there's so many people out there shouting from the rooftops, like do this trend, do that trend, you know, be plant-based, it's all keto, you know, don't give up alcohol, only drink red wine. There's just so much information. And what I love about the Brain Health Kitchen is that you make things seem so um, under easily understandable, number digestible. one. And, digestible. Hey. And digestible, but logical. You hey, know? I'm here all day. You even say okay. Well, like, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a secret. I've been a doctor for a really long time, and back when I was an obstetrician, I was really busy. I didn't really have time to talk to people about their diet that much. But I had I had a picture of the Mediterranean diet pyramid in my desk drawer, and people would say, "Andy, what should I eat?" I'd be like, "Here, eat like this." Um, the doc <laughs> doctors have been saying the same thing for years and years and years. It is just very basic. It's a, mostly a plant based diet. Um, now we're honing in on things that are most neuroprotective. So sure, you want to reach mm -hmm. for the foods that are neuroprotective. It doesn't mean you need to buy maca powder, or, like all those expensive, you know, superfood type things. It just means the basics, you know, fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables, um, olive oil. We don't want you avoiding to go bankrupt. Methods. We don't want anybody to go bankrupt to try and yeah. save their brain. No. Right. And make it enjoyable. Right. Make it a diet that you really okay. enjoy. Okay. So we don't so, have a ton of time yeah, left. Yeah, we're down to the last five minutes, and Instagram's going to kick us off automatically, so we have to <laughs> do thing, a lightning round. Here. One thing we do have to do, and that is, we've talked about food, we've talked about what your brain needs, we've talked about what your body needs, we've talked about how to de-stress, get more sleep, don't drink too much, and enjoy a balanced diet, but enjoy it, that's the key. If you don't enjoy it, you won't. it won't be sustainable. But what can we add, Ed, when we're doing all of these things, we're eating all these things, but possibly our brain is still not getting every single vital nutrient it needs? Well, I, okay, so here, here's the, this is a, I think Liz is, Liz is asking me to make a huge plug. And um, <laughs> so, so basically, so, so NeuroReserve, so I'm the founder of NeuroReserve and we're, and we're a nutritional, we're a nutrition company and we're Still obviously sure, focused on brain health. Uh, and, uh, and so, Part of the reason why the mind diet is so special to us is because uh, we know that the evidence is so strong there, and we 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 have a, a product that we developed called Relevate, and uh, and it's meant to help people uh, achieve the nutritional profile that the mind diet and the Mediterranean diet um, provide. Because not everybody can be perfect, of course, and that's one of the things that comes up a lot with many physicians. And I remember talking with Tom about this early on is that's really hard for people to change. So when people do start to make changes, it's really a great thing to celebrate. And a lot of times we kind of hit a limit. And so that's, um, that's, that's one thing I, I wanted to mention. I also wanted to mention one more thing also, and that is if, if you know, if you want to go to narrowreserve.com and learn more and, and maybe uh, try our product, uh, that'd be wonderful. But if you do, please support Mind What Matters. And so all of us, to one extent to another, are linked to Mind What Matters as board members. And Mind What Matters is a if caregiver you, I'd be really nervous, fun. Tom. So <laughs> my, Mind What Matters. They're coming for you, I'm, Tom. I'm, I'm subliminally yeah. roping yeah. Tom in. But, like, uh, but basically Mind What Matters is a caregiver relief fund that Liz founded. And uh, and so if you decide you you want to to, to try relevate, please use a code. It's like MWM fifteen. It's going to be in the, in the caption, you know. But but please please do that, um, and that way you're supporting Mind What Matters. Fifteen percent of your purchase will go, and that it's for forever purchases, all purchases you ever make. So which is a really generous so. generous thing that Ed has done. Even when this company was a newborn baby. Ed was sending us checks once a month, and it's been very appreciated, and okay. it's helped a lot of families. <laughs> Thank you. Like, we're, we're more like an infant now, I guess, so we're kind of crawling, <laughs> you know. We're two years old. <laughs> <laughs> we're like a two-year-old. So, but, uh, but, you know, just to wrap up, I mean, this is a wonderful panel. I, if, if people, if you like what you heard, uh, you want to hear more write it in the comments when we post it so that we can understand what you want to hear more of. And uh, if you want other follow-ups, things like that, we're going to try and follow up with some questions also just on Instagram and the posts later on, because I know we didn't get to everything. There were so many, uh, but just thank you so much for joining. And, and thank you so much, uh, Tom and, and Annie and Nikki and, and Liz for, for everything that you do for the Alzheimer's community. And thank and, you. And, and, yeah. And, and, and teaching us more about it. So, Love seeing you, everybody, today. Thank you, thanks, Ed. Thank oh, you for great. bringing us together. Thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah, and thank you, Appreciate everybody, it. for joining.
Thank Thanks you everybody. all so much. Thank you. Yes.